All right. Uh, thank you very much, Shweb. Uh, and uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, we now take the opportunity to start the uh, webinar more formally. Uh, today, uh, we have uh, our esteemed guest with us, uh, Professor Nabil Nasser from Rochester Institute of Technology in, uh, in US. And um, uh, I will probably say less myself about Nabil, and I will leave it to Nabil to introduce because uh, introduction is quite, uh, let's say, uh, for Nabil, could, should be a bit, bit more uh, comprehensive, which I don't think I will be able to cover myself everything. But uh, for sure, I mean, as the CEO and as the co-founder of Remade, which is one of the biggest, let's say, initiatives in the North American environment, to my understanding, uh, on uh, remanufacturing and also, of course, uh, connecting to the circular economy. So, Nabil, uh, we are really honored to have you uh, on this uh, webinar series that we run from the circular economy initiative at KTH, uh, which, as I said, we have been running this um, uh, initiative for five years. And now uh, we are in the fifth year right now. And uh, as I already explained to uh, some of the colleagues who were already here, but I will just uh, say it again that it's an initiative that uh, uh, has a purpose of uh, pushing the circular economy into research, education, and industry through our platform. Uh, of course, uh, first of all, within our organization, uh, uh, the Royal Institute of Technology, and then of course, later on, uh, also uh, collaborating through this platform uh, beyond uh, the institute itself and trying to explore both opportunities which are local, national, for example, regional and international. And uh, uh, having uh, Nabil on board today is of course uh, one of that, uh, <laughs> uh, let's say opportunity that we are exploring further. So I have with that, uh, I will leave the um, floor or let's say the the uh, opportunity with uh, Nabil. So Nabil, please, very welcome. Well, terrific. Well, well, first of all, thank you so much for the invitation, and I'm I'm really uh, I'm really uh, glad to have the opportunity uh, to speak to uh, to your team here and and uh, the guests about circular economy and remanufacturing. Just uh, very quick, I am Associate Provost and Director of the Galassano Institute for Sustainability at uh, Rochester Institute of Technology in the US, where uh, the, uh, I guess, one of the pioneers in the sustainable manufacturing area. And in 2017, we started the, um, a national initiative uh, funded by the government in the US uh, to establish an institute in the, rem in the uh, in the remanufacturing, recycling, circular economy area broadly called the Remade Institute. And I've been serving as its, uh, its, its CEO from the start. So I am going to, you know, again, I, I'm so glad to have the opportunity to speak to all of you here. So I'm just gonna start with some of my, my thoughts uh, and, and some of the background uh, that really got a lot of initiatives moving in this direction in the US and, and abroad. And, and, and some of those are, are really help us really get a better understanding of, of really wh what it is that we're really trying, what problem are we trying to solve? And, uh, you, you know, the realization that, that, that we, we actually have to do something different in the manufacturing side comes from many angles and the impact uh, of the uh, sustainable, more of, of uh, human development and, and expansion uh, in many areas from production to energy to others. So from energy consumption to social impact, to air pollution, to climate change, to deforestation and biodiversity, to waste generation there, you know, definitely there are a lot of challenges over time that, that we actually have felt that something has to be done differently. In the US, for example, we have, we, we, we actually looked at uh, manufacturing according to our Environmental Protection Agency as the largest contributor to climate change, uh, to greenhouse gas emission. Uh, when you consider the electricity used by industry, we are the largest. Uh, so there is uh, definitely um, has been a lot of realization that something we need to do something different and that 
uh, that movement in, in trying to figure out what are the best approaches and what are the methods that we need to use um, has been around for many years now. Uh, one of the things said that uh, as we think about uh, production, as we think about manufacturing a product, that we think about consumption, you know, one of the, the major things that we have to look at, if you fundamentally look at the challenges that we deal with, is that 98% of population growth until um, 2050 is coming from uh, developing countries. And, and the population growth in developed countries is, is only about, expected to be about 2%. So that adds a lot of, a lot of really uh, dilemmas for us. Uh, we need to share technology. Uh, we need to be progressive in the technology that we developed. Uh, there was a very interesting um, study that was done a while ago, and the title of the study was that basically is that China or India is or they going to save the world or they're going to destroy the world. Uh, the, the the rationale of the authors is that they will save the world if they come come up with their own. Uh, sophisticated technology far better than what, what we have been using in the West for many years to develop their own economy and, and their own industry. Uh, they would destroy the world if they copy the flawed systems that we developed over the years uh, that typically hasn't taken into account many of the challenges that we deal with globally. And one of the things I would like to mention is that since the beginning of the Industrial uh, Revolution, we had abundance of resources, abundance of land to absorb our waste. And I think, um, and we have uh, continued to operate in a, in a system that paid less attention to a lot of the challenges related to resource consumption, uh, related to um, waste generation, energy consumption. Um, you know, so our approaches haven't changed, uh, but, but, but the challenges have grown to be a lot bigger than when we started uh, at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. So, so uh, you can see here, for example, that we're talking about 3 billion new customers or consumers will enter the market in the, in the next 20 years. Uh, that represents a huge challenge. So there is significant demand for uh, product and services that is coming and uh, our capacity to meet the demand is, 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 uh, is quite a challenge. This picture here, actually, I took with my iPhone from my hotel room in one of the uh, really uh, fantastic city around the globe. And you can see here, I took the same picture, same location the following day. This is an in, the, the impact of industrialization. You can see here the following day, you actually realize that there are buildings across the street. You know, the day before the haze and, and the, you know, the pollution actually make it hard to see some of those. You can see here just the impact of a single day. And that's basically a lot of it is that because it's not necessarily that we're using technology uh, that is, um, that is uh, terrible or polluting um, you know, significantly. Uh, it, it's, it's basically the scale. I mean, the technology have worked in certain parts of the world, but when you actually increase the scale significantly, you end up with, with a lot of challenges. We do not understand sometimes uh, when you use the same technology that have proven to work uh, fairly okay around the globe, when you scale it up significantly, what that impact would be. And, and that's what we're realizing in a lot, of, a lot of places around the globe. So that's the kind of things that we would like to avoid. And that's the kind of things that we'd like to address through innovation. Uh, before I get into some of the data that I'm gonna share with you, I just wanna share with you where I got this data and, and the source, uh, because the source in this area is, is very important because there are a lot of data that are one-sided in terms of it, the, uh, the, 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 the way the data is collected, the assumptions sometimes uh, are not clear and, and uh, can bias the data in one way or another. This data that, that is, comes from the United Nations Environment Program International Resource Panel, which is a sister panel to the IPCC. And that panel consists of uh, 35, some of the top scientists in the world. Uh, we uh, collaborate with UNEP Secretariat as well as the steering committee consists of 25 government representative and the EU 
uh, government has been very, very active, very well represented in this panel. I serve on the scientific panel uh, since 2014. So, so that independent panel provide policy guidance and uh, the goal is to better understand the, the sustainable development uh, from a natural resource perspective, uh, resource efficiency. So one of the things that we actually saw our studies and there are a lot of studies that, that actually vary. The studies are highly validated and peer reviewed before it's ever published. Uh, so here we're talking about from 1970 today to today, we actually have tripled our um, uh, resource consumption, natural resource consumption, uh, 92 billion tons of global extraction, 20.2 uh, tons of material uh, demand per capita, I mean, these numbers are, are just fascinating. And if you take a look at the trend of that resource consumption from all different kinds of material, from biomaterial to, to fossil fuel to others, you see the trend is going upward. And, and the, if you track actually the growth of GDP globally, you would see that globally uh, it's tracking uh, you know, about the same, the same pattern and, and even a little bit higher. And, and one of the things, the misconception is that, well, but, but we are getting far more advanced in the global economy and we're far more resource efficient. And this black line here shows that this is absolutely not the case. So you can see here that while we're making progress in, in, in many countries, uh, there's still our resource efficiency or productivity is not, is not improving across, across the board. Uh, which is concerning as, as, uh, as resource productivity is, is one of those measures that we look at to ensure that we are doing better and better to, uh, to take advantage of the natural resources that we have, given the fact that a lot of the materials that we use are, are non-renewable, so the efficiency in using our resources is critical from a global perspective. So in, at, the, at my panel with UNIV, actually, we talk about decoupling. And decoupling there is, is really the, the spirit of what we're trying to do. Uh, as you can see here from this symbolic lines here, you can see that we're trying to, uh, over time, to continue, we, we, we need to continue to provide for that growth in consumer, number of consumers around the globe. We need to, uh, we need to also ensure that we increase the standard of living and the well-being of people around the globe. And we also need to continue economic growth around the globe. But it, what we're trying to do is decouple and decouple that from an environmental degradation. So the, the challenge is that how do we do that? How do we decouple um, economic growth uh, from, uh, from environmental degradation? And that's kind of the, the, really the spirit of what we're trying to do. So circular economy is one of those approaches. And uh, it, it, it basically, if you, if you, and unfortunately circular economy, I was involved with the Ellen MacArthur Foundation in 2010 and developing the first book on circular economy. Uh, and that term wasn't used by anybody at the time, except I think some uh, eco industrial parks in China that were using that term, but we use it in different way. And it really, and, and for full disclosure, I'm a trustee with the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. I've been working with them for years. So the goal is really to improve resource efficiency, decrease systemic energy and waste generation and decrease resource use. So from virgin material to energy and, and other uh, resources. So circular economy is one of those approaches that, that I think the foundation at the beginning thought it's important to get something that you can actually wrap your arms around it and, and be able to talk about tactical, uh, practical uh, ways to address many of the challenges that we face versus sometimes it's harder to, when you talk about sustainability, uh, to really get uh, to definitive areas where you can make some improvement. So the, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with that butterfly diagram and that right hand side, the blue side of that diagram, as you can see here, we, we talk about recycling, we talk about refurbishment, we talk about reuse, and we talk about improve the repair and maintenance. 
in the US, uh, circular economy has not had the same recognition that it is in Europe and some other places uh, in the world. So the data that I have uh, actually from a presentation that the, the co-chair of my panel actually uh, uh, gave this presentation at the World Economic Forum, but we're talking about from the data in Europe that it would raise, raise so grow resource productivity by 3% annually in Europe and, and also uh, bring economic benefit of 0.6 trillion per year by 2030. That's from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. And, and uh, also it's looked at, at as a way of reducing the EU emission uh, from materials by 56% and also reduce the uh, decarbonization cost of heavy industry significantly. So there's no doubt that, that move, movement in this direction actually would have significant positive impact if it is done correctly. Unfortunately, what we see today is a lot of effort that are really focused on waste minimization or, or uh, increased recycling rates. Uh, everything is looked at as circular economy, even though they are uh, moving towards circular economy, but, but it's, it's the circular economy is more of a system approach and a holistic approach looking into the big picture. And in one way, you can say that circular economy is, is all about a closed loop system where we actually continue to circulate our resources in the system to reduce our dependence on, on extra, more extraction. And, and one of the things that I would like to say is that um, significant portion of our manufacturing impact footprint come from material extraction and, and, uh, and processing. So we're talking about 80, 90%. Uh, so, so the more we can actually address the extraction, the better it's gonna be in terms of the footprint. So now, uh, since we're talking about a closed loop system and, and uh, from repair to refurbishment to basically recycling, uh, remanufacturing surface is one of the most critical areas uh, to enable circular economy implementation. The reason for that is that remanufacturing has significant margins and, and, and by itself, even though you're not necessarily uh, doing direct uh, recycling, um, you know, in a manufacturing, in remanufacturing facility, but you're facilitating recycling, but you're able to bring the product back, you have a closed loop system to bring the product back and, and extract what has value left. Uh, and the rest obviously can be directed toward recycling. So from a so 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 simply if you're not familiar with your manufacturing, you're taking a product like a jet engine, landing gear for an aircraft, uh, a diesel engine, the automotive uh, system. Uh, medical equipment, and you basically tear it down to the component level, you clean and inspect every single part to meet the same specification as new parts. The ones, uh, like for example, a, a blo engine block, for example, if it is worn, there are processes that are highly efficient processes to bring it back to the same uh, condition as, as new part by depositing new material by uh, middle spraying by uh, 3D deposits of material on those engine blocks. And, and those are highly effective in getting the, those valuable castings to like new condition. So from a business perspective, it, it reduced the need for uh, new raw material and the energy associated with that. It lowers the cost during the the, the, the list uh, production waste and emission per unit uh, when you use remanufacturing, uh, it, it also provides an opportunity uh, for a service model. So you, you, you sell the service versus a product, for example. From an environmental side, obviously, there is significant reduction in greenhouse, greenhouse gas emission. It conserves uh, about 80% of, of, uh, of the raw material and labor that is used by, by being able to use a lot of those components and modules, uh, multiple life cycles. It offers significant saving in the, you know, again, annual energy consumption 
and and uh, as well as material consumption and energy and and so on. And so it has uh, you know significant um, significant environmental impact, lower environmental impact. And I'll show you some data on this here in a few minutes. So, but but for for the technical people, and I I know we have. Uh, um, I know we have some some people who, who are in this area. Oops, I'm going. Um, let's see here. So uh, for the technical people here, uh, and and I've been doing a lot of work in this area uh, since the early '90s, and um, uh, you know I've been preaching about remanufacturing for so many years. So my my colleagues call me the Pope of remanufacturing because of that length of time and and really promoting remanufacturing around the globe. So the biggest issue, I think a lot of government uh, people, as well as a lot of industry people would wonder, well, you know, uh, remand product that might not be as good as new product and am I taking more risk? In reality, we, we do something we call the, the remaining useful life. And if you take, if this here presents uh, the, the, um, the, 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 basically the, the behavior of a module or a, or a, or a unit that we're trying to look at from remani from a, for for remanufacturing purposes, and and uh, you know there are certain features that you track, and those features can degrade, and when they degrade, the, the product will be close to the point where it would fail. So, for example, here you can see here is a line where, you know, this unit and uh, the features indicate. Uh, using many many ways, actually, we can analyze the behavior of those units. Uh, it would indicate basically its its condition and its its potential failure. And you can see here there is a certain point of time where a the the, the that unit is going to degrade, and and that's the time where you expect to see some failures. But during that time, when the unit is healthy and the feature is very strong. If you can have multiple life cycle within that zone, uh, you're able to have a product that basically, uh, from a from a reliability point of view, is is very reliable and would have a behavior similar to the first life cycle, if it was falling within that range. So basically, uh, we're looking for the technology that allow us to understand the remaining useful life and make sure that when whatever we do in terms of using multiple life cycle, it has to, the, the, that unit or that module has to be within that healthy uh, area that, that it wouldn't fail and it wouldn't constitute more risk for the manufacturer. So now, uh, you know, so, so remanufacturing has been around for many years. Uh, the, the, uh, the first industrialist uh, in the U.S., and the U.S. market is the largest in the world, the first industrial in the U.S. that realized um, that remanufacturing has great potential for, for the customer of his products was Henry Ford. When he saw many cars, the engines actually reached that point where they degraded to a point where they have to be replaced. So he realized that there's significant value left in those engines, that, that if they are remanufactured, he can get them back to like new condition. So in 1930s, you know, Ford, Henry Ford started that organized remanufacturing facility for his engines. Uh, before that, there was agriculture. There was a lot of other uh, uh, reman activities also in the U.S. So the U.S. has been, we have sectors that are very strong in remanufacturing for, you know, hundred years and we have others who are brand new to remanufacturing and we have some sectors that haven't tried even at all. So you can see here from this map, uh, the data related to the volume, uh, some of it is, is uh, some organization do it as self-serving, you know, trying to, uh, to show that the number is, is higher than what is practically there. Uh, in the US, we the latest studies that we did on the side of the industry was in, in 2012. So we still, the data is very lacking on the size. You know, my estimate is, is about 150 to 200, and 200 billion a year industry around the globe. Uh, there, is, um, there is not much going on. Uh, very few, for example, uh, companies that you would see in, in uh, when it, here we're talking about true remanufacturing, not refurbishment or repair. Uh, you would see very few in Africa, you know, some 
uh, some in China, uh, that is, uh, that sector is growing in China, Europe and the US have more mature sectors, uh, but limited number of sectors. Uh, and there's some in South America as well. Uh, if we take a look at the US, where we actually did a study in, in 2012 on the industry size and, and so on, it was uh, it didn't include many of the, the defense uh, side, and the defense industry is the largest remanufacturer in the world. Uh, my estimate is that it's about 80 billion a year uh, in the US. Uh, the industry employed 180,000 jobs, and that's from 2012. The aerospace sector is a non-defense, uh, largest non-defense sector we have. You know, my categorization of the industry in the U.S. is that we have we have about 13 sectors, and um, and and uh, you can see here at the bottom from aerospace to automotive to consumer product to electrical apparatus, IT equipment, furniture, heavy-duty equipment, imaging product. Um, locomotive system, machinery, medical equipment, restaurant equipment, tires, those are sectors that we identify as, as, the, um, as organized and significant sectors. Uh, there are material handling system, for example, that are remanufactured. There are conveyors, uh, I'm sorry, um, there are cranes that are remanufactured. There are a lot of things uh, that, that are remanufactured. Uh, this is a, an older map here, but it shows basically distribution of the industry in the U.S., uh, which again is, is significant, and um, in just about every state. Um, just an example of the remanufacturing industry in the U.S., uh, you know, it goes from landing gears, uh, to uh, actuators, to engines, to fuel system, to electronics, to navigation system, to radios, and many of the auxiliary uh, power units. Um, they are, again, from the data isn't necessarily updated, but uh, a new landing gear, for example, would cost uh, two to eight million uh, versus the remanufacturing one would be 10% of that of new. So the uh, that industry is, always very common to use remanufacture components uh, because they, it's a highly regulated industry and it's very prescribed in terms of what process to use and, and how you certify it. And uh, it has been around for many, many years. If you actually fly in an aircraft today, it's, it's probably chances that nine out of 10 uh, times that uh, this aircraft has had so many cycles of remanufacture modules uh, in this aircraft. And some of the leaders are the largest, like Airbus and Boeing, for example, are some of the largest companies uh, who remanufacture from landing gears to engines to others. Uh, the, the kind of companies in the remanufacturing area, some of them, we call them the OEM, the original equipment manufacturer. Those are like the Caterpillar, the John Deere, the General Electric, Siemens, um, and then there's also some contract remanufacturers. So those are basically in collaboration with the manufacturers are, are basically um, able to, um, to remanufacture and typically under that, the manufacturers, the OEM flag. There's also independent remanufacturing companies when those are typically uh, companies that are um, small, medium-sized companies. And, and those typically are independent, and there is a lot of reverse engineering for them to be able to man remanufacture the product versus the contract remanufacturers would have access to the OEM data and processes, and typically the OEM will dictate how the process should be conducted. So there is a big difference here. In the automotive industry, uh, most of the uh, number of companies that we have in this area globally are independent companies and uh, very few that are contracted with the manufacturers. So now for, for the research, uh, you know, people here that are looking for areas where we need a lot more uh, technology, we need a lot more innovation. This series is a listing of areas where we actually, we have significant opportunities. So the business case for remanufacturing, especially in sectors where it's not done today, uh, is is 
we need many, um, we need a lot of work in this area to be able to justify for companies and think about the reverse logistics and think about the business model uh, to basically justify, uh, you know, a change in the way we, we handle some of the product sector today where remanufacturing doesn't take place. Uh, so this is an area of, of significant interest. Uh, it cuts across again, reverse logistics to uh, business model, to market transformation, to a lot of things that would facilitate growth in this area. The technology area is significant. This is from condition assessment to, um, to technologies for repair and restoration of components and systems to uh, the development of, of uh, you know, testing systems, uh, units, machines, that allow to determine basically the condition of a unit after it's been restored. So there is a, uh, from additive manufacturing to surface cleaning to contaminant removal, uh, there is a lot of work still on the technology side uh, that, that, that need to be done. Uh, reverse logistics is how we collect, how we collect those parts, what mechanism to use, and, and uh, the algorithm around that is uh, also an area of significant need. Uh, the, a lot of issues related to cross-border restrictions that we suffer from in the remanufacturing side. Do. So this is the open market access issue that it threatens the growth of the industry. Uh, I think uh, a lot of it is the complexities of the, uh, you know, of, of, the, of trade uh, that complicates the situation for remanufacturing, for example, that need to be addressed. Uh, there are no standards and there is an ISO committee now that looking into standards and circular economies are trying to address also remanufacturing. Uh, but, but I think there is a lot more to be need to be done in this area. And then there is also the public perception. There is a lack of understanding that with three man product, when it's done correctly, it meets the same requirement as new. So a lot of issues related to educating consumers, I think are, are need to be addressed. So I talked earlier about the uh, UNIP IRP, and I'll just share with you a few slides from a study that I, I finished in, in 2018, uh, December of 2018. I actually was in, the results were introduced at the at the National Press Club in Tokyo, um, and in the, the 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 title for it was "Redefining Values: A Manufacturing Revolution." This is my colleague from the EU government actually chose this name or he, he thought I, we should have a more of a exciting name. So that was uh, he's making. Uh, but the goal was really to look to quantify the value of circular processes in manufacturing from science uh, to decision making. And, you know, the, the this is a kind of an eye chart here, but the goal for this, basically, the model is looking at how do we account for material flow in production uh, that we typically use raw uh, version material to make new product and, and, and track material flow based on that. In this case here, we're looking at version material, uh, imported cores. So the end of life product is what we call it a core. And then also there is domestic cores and there's also a volume of recycled material. So in the future with a circular model, basically we need to consider all of those as inputs to a system related to satisfying the material demand for that production system. And that's what we're trying to track and we're trying to understand as we looked into some very strong models in this area. And, and this slide here shows you like from an environmental impact, the differences between an OEM new to remanufacture product to more what I call a comprehensive refurbishment. This is more of a very sophisticated refurbishment process uh, that doesn't necessarily get the part to like new condition, uh, but restore its function uh, to, uh, to, uh, to a very uh, uh, reliable performance. Uh, versus remanufacturing, we're required to bring the, the product to like new condition. So you can see here, that in terms of the embodied energy, when you have a brand new product, you can see the consumption of energy, obviously it has its own uh, environmental impact is significantly higher than if you just compare the blue here, 
than the embodied energies that we have in remanufacturing. If you look into the emissions, if you look into process energy, you can see that that um, uh, you know that that embodied energy actually dwarf every everything else. If I look at it just from a materials impact, you can see here making new product. Um, you can see here that the consumption of virgin material is much much higher than it is for a remanufactured product. And now the green here represent the production waste associated with that new build, as well as uh, production waste associated with remanufacturing. And you can see here that the impact from a material uh, point of view is, is significant, uh, significantly lower. And that shows basically the impact of remanufacturing uh, and the value of doing this. Uh, we, we looked at product, for example, uh, the we call them um, the uh, digital printers, those are the large quarter of a million dollar digital printer. Uh, there are a few companies uh, actually around the globe that actually make those. Uh, when we looked into the uh, more of the, 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 the production share, you would see 60 per 66 percent uh, were new. The remanufacturing share was 32.9%. And this data is a little bit misleading because uh, we looked at it from a dollars and cents and the, the cost of remanufacture product is typically half of the new. So, so the percentages can be further calibrated based on that. But you can see here when remanufacturing is viable because it is very viable in the sector and very common, you can see uh, the refurbishment versus repair they become very, very small compared to actually making new product. And, and that's really very telling because you're capturing the product and uh, for, for many, many uh, cycles and you're using for a copier, for example, those large copier have very heavy steel frames. So you're able to use it multiple times. So you're satisfying the demand uh, for many cycles. We compared the, uh, the, the situations in US, Germany, Brazil, and China. And one of the things that we looked at is that what facilitate uh, remanufacturing growth in, in those countries. And what we discovered is that regulation and, and market access, the open economy model is, is number one. So if, if there are regulations, like for example, that it used to exist in China, to say, do not import or export remanufacture product. There is there is nothing else matters. You know, remanufacturing growth in this country is is definitely um, is dead. Uh, but once you actually do have some openness to uh, you know to to remanufacturing by regulations and market access, you can see technical barriers are 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 definitely. Um, represent significant barriers that you need to have the technology to be able to do this. Market barriers, if the market is, is open to buying the product, if not, you're probably gonna have a lot of difficulty uh, you know, growing a sector in this area. And then the recovery barriers, if you're unable to bring the product back so you can remanufacture it, uh, then you have a lot of challenges in, in actually uh, growing a sector in this area. In Germany, I think uh, was very much similar to the US, Brazil, there is a lot of restrictions continue, and we just had a, actually a, a workshop with the between the U.S. government and the Brazilian government that I spoke at a few weeks ago, talking about some of the bear elimination in Brazil and China uh, has pilots and uh, it start to open the market for remanufactured product was still have a lot of restrictions, uh, but typically. Those are the, the really the enablers for growing a remanufacturing sector in any country. And, and the, the, you know, the bottom line, I think what we're saying here is that, um, that, that you, you bring resources to manufacturing and you start processing this material, manufacturing it, making product. At the end of life, you're disassembling and identifying components that have high value to be fed back into the cycle of making, you know, another uh, product, and and ultimately, and this cycles can be four or five times uh, in the toner cartridge area. They can be nine times, 
And, and the, there's always gonna be a full out ratio here uh, of components that, that are not meeting the requirement that you separate and you send to the recycling stream. So now we, we you know, this kind of descri describe a lot of the background related to remanufacturing and, um, and circular economy in general. You know, the key here is that this industry has lacked uh, investment in R&D. While we invest heavily in making new product, making new technology for aircraft and automotive systems, uh, in the remanufacturing area has not had the same level of attention. So as I mentioned, I've been in this area since 1990 or before, and I, uh, you know, uh, I, I used to travel was always with a, with a slide set there that, that title, what is remanufacturing? So there is a lack, uh, even in the technical world, of understanding what even remanufacturing is. So you can imagine investment in R&D in this area was very much lacking. So, um, so the, the US government uh, uh, was developing national institutes. Um, it started um, about 10 years ago and they identified areas uh, that are critical to uh, the manufacturing sector competitiveness and growth. And uh, the, the area of remanufacturing, increasing remanufacturing and recycling and, and, and circular economy uh, was chosen as one of those areas. So we had in the US, we had to compete. We had large teams to compete. And we uh, ended up basically, uh, my team won this uh, designation to establish a national institute on, uh, in this area. We, we call it the Remade Institute, which stands for uh, reducing embodied energy and decreasing emission in materials manufacturing. And you can see here, the goal of it is really to develop transformational technologies. Uh, we're in the early stage R&D. We're trying to develop technologies that can be game changers uh, from expanding recycling, recovery, remanufacturing, and reuse uh, to reduce primary material consumption, to increase utilization of secondary material or recycled material, uh, lowering energy consumption. And one of the major issues that we're after are reducing or achieving that cost parity, many times recycled material are more expensive than version material, which make it hard to promote its use. So uh, you can see here, our goals are to five-year goals is to reduce the primary feedstock consumption by 30%, to decrease uh, uh, secondary processing energy. Th those are the energy needed to recycle material by 30% to increase the embodied energy efficiency by 20%, 25%, and, and reduce greenhouse gas emission by 25%. Um, so this here, uh, since January 2021, we actually uh, saw 60% growth in membership. So we have 76 uh, companies like Unilever, Michelin, Nike, Caterpillar, John Deere, uh, Ford, and many others, uh, Dow, BSF, we also have 33 academic institution and 30 trade association and six of the US national labs. So that consortium has been growing significantly and our reach is probably through our members and the trade association is, is probably close to 5,000 uh, members. And uh, the way we designed it is to really have a system analysis node that guides the selection of project and priorities. We have a design for re-X node. We have a manufacturing material optimization, uh, remanufacturing and end of life reuse and uh, recycling node is one of the largest nodes. So uh, just to, uh, <laughs> I, I wanted to share with you as much as I can uh, to give an idea about what's going on here in the US, which has been really significant. Uh, the, 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 the Institute is all focused on promoting uh, growth and circular economy through innovation. So we have uh, very large projects uh, that uh, a lot of them are really focused on transformational technology. We have 84 of them. And um, uh, we have a lot of inventions and, and uh, a lot of publication in those. So just to give you an idea, the goals that I mentioned earlier, for example, reducing greenhouse gas emission and manufacturing of materials 
we have already achieved 130% of our five-year uh, targets and embodied energy. And, and so the technology that we develop actually is capable of reducing all of the US manufacturing emission by 11.5%. Embodied energy, 125%. And we're still meeting, uh, we will be meeting our five-year mark for materials, primary material and secondary material uh, use. So, um, so there's, yes, you know, it surprised all of us who work in this area that when you actually deal with a problem from all of its elements, you're able to achieve significant, uh, significant results. Uh, this work here is, is actually from one of my colleagues uh, who's the node lead for the system analysis node uh, from Yale University, and this is here tracking material flow of seven plastic types. And the thickness of the line here implies the volume of this materials flowing in the system from the, you know, from the feedstock, from the draw material side, all the way to what you see here at the bottom is the, the disposal and landfill. The volume that actually end up going through recycling is that very thin line at the top. So we still have a way to go in recycling and recycling technology. And what we'd like to do is see significant volume moving in that direction to recycling versus what happens uh, today. So some of the plastic, uh, some of the actually successfully recycled material in plastic, for example, in the US, we recycle just about 9%. So with that, I'm just gonna shift over to give you some example of the work that we're doing at the Institute. And it's, it's phenomenal when you have an Institute that is really focused on making significant impact and uh, focus on the system level. So we're focusing on developing design tools for circular economy, uh, which again is, is our main focus. So we're, we wanna develop uh, the tools, uh, we want to be able to quantify, we want to be able to evaluate, and we want to be able to pilot some of this technology. So there, these are examples of some of the projects that we have here, uh, you know, materials and vehicle design for high value recycling of automotive aluminum and steel. And this is University of Michigan, Ford, Novellus, which is a company, uh, automotive uh, uh, tier one supplier, Argonne National Lab, uh, Institute for Scrap Recycling, Aluminum Association, Light Middle uh, Consultants. So that's just an example of one of our projects where you see from a company like Novalis and Ford involved with university and national lab in tackling some of those big problems. Uh, development of design for remanufacturing software, um, and that is uh, RIT, Caterpillar, and the Remanufacturing Industry Council involved in to creative, the creation of design tools to increase 3X in the solar industry. And you can see here from University of Pittsburgh to University of California, to National Renewable Energy, Energy Lab, to Yale University, Alfred University, uh, Sun King Aluminum Association. So there is every project as a mix of industry as well as academic uh, institution, as well as national lab. And this has been an amazing formula. Um, the last area that I'm just going to talk about here is what we call it, you know, uh, digital remanufacturing, which is uh, really trying to accelerate growth and remanufacturing and ensure that that's done through technology. And, and one of the things that we do in remanufacturing is that we do less automation than we do in new build. So here with digital remanufacturing, we're trying to add a lot of automation, a lot of sophisticated technology in this area. And, and those are example of the project that we have here, improving uh, remanufacturing efficiency in commercial vehicle tires through additive manufacturing, uh, condition assessment of used electronics, and rapid damage identification to reduce remanufacturing costs. So, so those are example of the project that we have. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, every project typically have a lot of partners and, and it is the, the right way in my mind to actually have that public private partnership to work together to address many of those uh, challenges. So I am gonna uh, stop here and, and hand it back to uh, my, my hosts here. And I, again, I thank you for your attention and I hope this, uh, I hope this was useful to give you an idea about 
the, the background in this area, uh, the growth and circular economy, and, and also some examples of the work that's going on in the US. Uh, so thank you for your attention. Thank you for this nice presentation. So if you have any question, you can write on the chat or you can raise your hands. Yeah, there is one from Robin. Robin, do you want to ask by yourself or may I read? Uh, yeah, uh, great presentation again, uh, Dr. Nazar. Um, I was, uh, as you can see from the question, was uh, interested if you would have any comments on uh, what used to be called the Anti-Gray Market Alliance and uh, is being rebranded as anti-counterfeiting and uh, whether you have any opposition to your goals in the uh, private sector. Um, I, I think that there, the, there are a lot of complexity, especially in the remanufacturing world. Um, you know, uh, some of it, for example, an area that we had a lot of a lot of complexity was the toner cartridge area. For example, the, the companies, th those products were always ending up in landfill, and we started to actually see hundreds of thousands of those being taken back from going to landfill and diverted to remanufacturers. And it's been like a, you know, the the, the challenges here is the manufacturer of those products when this product is remanufactured. Uh, that they consider that to reduce the new product that they can sell. So they were in, at war with the independent companies that were remanufacturing those products. And, and there, it, it, the reality is that the money, I mean, the environmentally and from a business perspective, from consumer perspective, it's the right thing to do if you can do it effectively and, and they can. Uh, but the competition came from really uh, what I call it the grades, the companies that are trying to make money, uh, even though they realize they, they're doing that and it's not the best for the consumer because obviously the, the, car, the remanufacturer cartridge has lower costs. Uh, so sometimes it's because somebody else is making the money, not them, you end up with a lot of these issues. So there, there are a lot of cases you get to dive deep into some of the rationale behind those groups. Uh, I think what when from a science from the science community point of view, uh, we see that as a very positive thing when you can actually remanufacture the product and bring it back to like new condition, every, everybody wins. But when there are uh, competition, who's gonna make the money and, and business model, you, you end up getting a lot of friction. And, um, and I, I think that a lot of those challenges are, are in my mind, I think um, can be artificial, uh, but, I'm not as, as familiar as Robin is with some of those, uh, the, the, the anti-counterfeit groups, for example, activities lately, uh, haven't followed them to really see what they're up to these days. Thank you. Another question? May I just uh, yeah. come in? And, all right. Uh, Nabil, thank you very much for very interesting and, of course, uh, useful insight. So it's always a pleasure listening to you. Uh, I just thought of, uh, let's say, uh, I think you, you started your presentation and mentioned uh, a rather quite close connection with the IPCC, all right, uh, through your scientific uh, uh, council, probably, if I understood correct. And... Um, uh, it's been interesting to, let's say, see that IPCC has considered, let's say, circular economy now as one of the pathways, right, to, to probably um, environmental mitigation. Um, but when I read, for example, the report, uh, which actually is nowadays under our <laughs> scrutiny as well, particularly from the circular economy point of view, uh, it sounds like they are uh, uh, not really uh, uh, having, for example, um, clear evidence of uh, uh, all the impacts that uh, we in the circular economy community talk about, right? And uh, they sounded like very skeptical of uh, 
let's say having those uh, data that is available, for example, being a relatively um, a less peer reviewed work and more uh, uh, gray data, for example. And then of course, uh, also uh, based on whatever is out there uh, in the, let's say, uh, sphere of research or um, uh, development, uh, they are uh, very, let's say, reluctantly rating it as uh, a medium level, uh, for example, impact on, uh, on, the, on the mitigation you know, for the climate action. And I'm wondering, I mean, now, for example, looking at the data that you have shared with us, and I think we have been uh, looking at this data for a while uh, now, and uh, we have uh, um, convincing evidence, at least in the circular economy community, that uh, the impact can be very, very significant. As you said, if the, uh, the sort of uh, approach is taken more systemic, at systemic, in a systemic view. So what's your opinion? I mean, how can, for example, uh, this, um, is, is, it a, is it a matter of uh, better communication, for example, with this uh, IPCC community from the circular economy community? so that uh, things can be, let's say, made more um, clear on both sides, that if we, what we claim on, in the circular economy community and what, for example, they are understanding, probably it's a communication gap here. So what's your opinion on that? Uh, well, I think we, 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 without, without uh, getting myself in trouble <laughs> here, I think the, the, the IPCC is, is, has done a phenomenal job in, in really addressing the, the climate change and, and the direct uh, contributor to climate change and, and what need to be done to, uh, to uh, address a lot of challenges with climate change. Uh, but, but I think circular economy and a lot of the, uh, you know, a lot of approaches like circular economy, for example, that can be, needs a lot of study, need a lot of depth. And this is, uh, this is really a bipanel the International Resource Panel is focused on resource efficiency and focus on studying a lot of those with significant depths. Uh, I think uh, people who work in circular economy have the burden of, of really proving the impact and we haven't done a good job at that. And I think a lot of times, I think a lot of organizations, when they refer to circular economies, they refer to simple processes of, of uh, waste reduction, or increased recycling or something like that. And it, they fail to understand that circular economy is, is far more than just a single factor or a single process. So I think we, we, we've, the study that I refer to uh, in my talk was one of the first studies that my panel has taken uh, on. And uh, I have actually some people uh, in my panel are also in the IPCC panel so we do have uh, common members as well. And I'm doing another study on circular economy, specifically targeting like consumer electronics and more of the, 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 the B to C model. And I think, so we're getting there. We're getting there to provide a lot of information and a lot of evidence. The Remade Institute data uh, was never available uh, before to show that impact. And I think once you actually illustrate a lot of this data, I think you expect to see a lot more recognition of, of the impact of circular economy in addressing a lot of those challenges. Thank you. Yeah. Um, we have last one minute, so uh, maybe one quick question. If not, uh, then maybe Amir, you can uh, uh, say the It is one in the chat. Oh, okay. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Hello, Nabil. Yeah, yes, thank you from Singapore. Nice to see you again. Nice yeah. To see you too. So, yeah, thanks for the great presentations. I have one question. Uh, may I have your views in terms of the manufacturing in the areas of EV battery and polar, uh, solar panels? So, when the whole world is moving towards digitalization, green energy, right? I, I believe there is a huge demand pushing towards EV batteries for electrical vehicles and also the green energy, right? So would you please share with us your views on what is the opportunity post for remanufacturing down the way, right? And what is the challenge that you have foreseen in these areas? Yes, well, it, it, it's it's good to hear from you, Shan Chan. She, by the way, uh, no bias here. Shan Chan worked with me and 
her PhD work years ago. Uh, uh, she's uh, she's from Singapore and one of the brightest people I work with uh, uh, in the past. Uh, there are definitely significant significant interest in the EV area. We're doing a lot of work on the EV area. The the key here is that seventy percent of the cars used in electric vehicles are new. You know they're not the common components that we use in in previous the, the ICE cars. So, uh, so there, uh, the junkyards that we use in the in the U.S. around the globe efficiently for years is no longer going to be able to deal with high voltage systems, and uh, we're dealing with an e-waste problem here that isn't necessarily uh, the same that we dealt with with mechanical and electromechanical system of the past. So there is definitely a lot of challenges there. Uh, the, one of them is that the highest value is in the batteries. Well, the battery chemistry is is dynamic. I mean, today, you know, going from the batteries of Teslas of today to the 4680 and LFB batteries, and so there are a lot. Of, so the, the we are in the innovation cycle, and we haven't yet reached that maturity of this industry. So I think it's hard to address a lot of recycling issues uh, today uh, while the technology is moving. Uh, the Remade Institute is working with one of the largest remanufacturer of battery, uh, automotive battery in, in the U.S., for example, where we're taking modules. Once the battery reached 75 percent capacity, they are no longer good for automotive systems. So we take it and repackage them for other application or the company does that. And uh, it's been very successful. So there there is a lot of work to be done in this area and for researchers. Like you, I think uh, th this is uh, a great opportunity to ensure that we actually do this right. But historically, we have done uh, not such a good job with electronic systems, and this car is an is a is an electronic system. Uh, so we gotta have to do a lot more than we've done in the past with electronics uh, recycling to be able to recover this material that are highly integrated and highly. Um, uh, you know, um, uh, or, or very difficult to actually separate and and uh, and and uh, bring the material back to the use uh, use stream. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Nabil. Thanks so much. Sure. I think there's also great uh, research work um, proposals ongoing. Uh, I mean, from the single side, definitely looking forward to catch up with you in another chance uh, to seek for collaborations. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, we are out of time now, so maybe Amir, you can say some closing remarks. Yeah, just uh, th I would, of course, like to thank uh, Nabil once more uh, for being available. I mean, uh, thank you for your time and, uh, of course, a very interesting insight uh, on what, for example, is happening in the remanufacturing industry. And, of course, um, very much interest I had in this uh, remade, um, uh, you know, initiative that, that you are running. I was just as a, a last question, maybe that, uh, do you have any collaboration model that is going beyond the United States as well? For example, if let's say uh, we would like to collaborate uh, through Remade, uh, is there any model that is uh, existing or you think that it's just only for the, for the United States? I think people who, who actually work in this area, we, we do have uh, a moral responsibility to share work together, collaborate, because, you know, this is the only way for us, for all of us to make a difference. So we are very open for collaboration. Okay. Uh, I think the government uh, is, is open uh, for collaboration. Uh, and I mentioned that before I, I serve on several advisory boards in the EU, and a lot of that facilitate exchange of ideas, but we definitely are very open uh, for collaboration. Um, you know, there, there, this is, in my mind, I think if 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 there are discoveries and and uh, great work happening in some of those areas, and we don't share it, it would be shame on us. So we, we we definitely are very open. We haven't had yet because the Remade Institute is only five years old. Uh, we haven't had any uh, major model development in this area, but we do collaborate a lot. We do share information. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a conference uh, that would be. Um, uh, that, that we would have to highlight and show, show showcase a lot of technology development remade that will be international uh, mm -hmm. that we'll be announcing soon. Uh, so we're definitely very open to opportunities for collaboration. 
Absolutely. Thank, thank you. Excellent. I think then we definitely need to catch up further. <laughs> in the sure, sure. So, Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you very much. And uh, well, thank you, everybody, uh, for joining the, the, the webinar. So we will continue with this series in the coming months as well. And uh, we hope to see you again. So thank you, Nabil. Yeah, thank you very much. And thank you for uh, all of you for your attention. And uh, I am always impressed with what Amir is doing and the creative work that you guys are doing. And, uh, and uh, again, thank you for the opportunity. And uh, uh, we hope we will be uh, uh, stay in touch. Yes, definitely. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Bye, everybody. Bye bye.